Okay. Well, good evening or good afternoon to all of you. Um, I was invited by uh, Roger Scruton uh, following uh, the story when Simon Rattle refused to come to to London because of the London concert halls. And Roger asked me to to do a design for where a nice concert hall could be situated in London. <coughs> I remember when I lived for I lived for 25 years in London and I went at least once a week to concerts either in the Festival Hall or in the Queen Elizabeth Hall or the Purcell Room or wherever, Barbican or Albert Hall and <coughs> the only ones which were architecturally pleasant was Albert Hall but the acoustic were just <laughs> impossible for an orchestra or pianist and Every visit to the Royal Festival Hall was a pain, even though it was the best music produced in the world. And then <clears throat> when uh, Cedric Price had done on um, the GLC's invitation a master plan for the uh, South Bank, all he could think of was to improve the South Bank with a mile-long bench, which he, he pro produced as if it was an innovation and which was just a copy from the benches which line the footpath in Central Park in New York. And so um, Dan Cruikshank and um, Blueprint, um, Dan Sujic, they asked me to do an, uh, a kind of counter project you know, for free, of course. Uh, I think Cedric had gone several hundred many many thousands of pounds for this great idea so <clears throat> i played the architect and dan Cruikshank was my prince <laughs> so we visited the area and he instructed me what he wanted and uh, so i drew this master plan how to improve this but it was very conservative because it was meant to maintain uh, virtually everything i'll show it later and then uh, <clears throat> because the second bad experience was the Barbican and then we heard that um, the, the government or whoever wanted to build a new concert hall instead of the in the place of the London Museum which is the worst place I can't imagine a worse place in London to build a concert hall than this and so I chose a site which I thought was really belonged to the the Queen's Estate, and uh, which is central location, and where it would really be pleasant to go uh, to a concert and enjoy music. And I thought that because you know to have an important building, you need a central location which is on focus already, and then you add a little jewel to it, and it really begins to shine. And one of the most spectacular spaces in London is, of course, the. A park crescent but you can't really see it as a crescent so the idea would be to get rid of the fences uh, crown lift the waterloo uh, plane trees and pave it all the way through and then plant the uh, a concert hall a musician's residence and an, a school and a chamber orchestra uh, hall and this was because it was it could be considered a, a scandal but in fact in the first scheme of of john nash you had a church on that intersection of portland uh, is it called portland yes portland it's portland street isn't it and uh what's this called the big Big Avenue, Montague, or no. Marylebone Road, and Marylebone Road, the horrendous Marylebone Road, mm -hmm. which is actually not that bad. It's just that the traffic is is so horrible, and so that would be an extremely important crossroads of Regent Street, uh, Portland Street, and the uh, the park, and then Marylebone Road, which is really an, a, a geographic cut through through London, and on that intersection, that's a place to create. And John Martin actually proposed this monument for Waterloo over that, on that crossing. <clears throat> so you have very a central place that belongs to the crown, and maybe you know one day when 
King Charles reigns, uh, something would be possible. And the idea was to, to have a traditional hall because all musicians I know uh, complain about uh, the concert halls, not just in London, but almost everywhere. That uh, the best hall in London was the best acoustics was Queen's Hall, but it was destroyed by fire in 1945. And uh, according to Toscanini, it had the best, the best acoustics. Other great places of great acoustics are the Concertgebouw in Amsterdam. So I thought we take one of those, uh, or the Musikverein in Vienna, we take those proportions and that size, and then use that. And the architecture would be the one of John Nash. The, pave, the square would be paved all across, so this becomes, it's stagnant traffic anyway, so they creep across this shared surface uh, just at the same speed that they do now but you would open then as you come down Portland Street is it called street or row forget where the where the Arabia is it's Portland Place Portland Place voila so you would see right under the crown uh, you would see this uh, group the concert <coughs> room would be the size this ensemble that's the size the b is a concert hall with a very large niche for the orchestra and that compares to very famous concert places like the albert hall um forget now teatro colon in buenos aires Stadthal of Wuppertal. these are all places with great acoustics vienna music Verein, and uh, the good thing about the Philharmonic in Luxembourg, which is my hometown, is the is that the architecture is very ugly and also the concert hall, but it has a great idea. It has a, a big walk all around. So I thought this is a great idea because the walk around Albert Hall is not a great walk. It's too low, it's too narrow, it's not in proportion with the concert hall. So I thought that we could have a big ambulatory all around the concert hall. <laughs> so that would be the foyer with a big view over the park. And and this is a view coming from a Portland place. I ah, know this from the park. And you have the you have very large stoop where you enter from both sides, from south and from the park, big covered portico where you enter sideways. And from that portico you have fantastic view of the park. Uh, this chamber, chamber music hall. Uh, this would be the musician residencies and so on, for the soloists who, who come there. That's a view from uh, from Tottenham Court, from above Tottenham Court Road. I just have a few images, and it's not not long. Well, not then. And some sketches. <coughs> and uh, that is what I proposed for when Dan was my prince <laughs> for the South Bank. You would keep the concert hall, you would just wrap it in new architecture, particularly the National Theatre would be built in with lots of new buildings would have some turrets, the shell building is here, and you would have some urban. And actually all these spaces were, were free to develop. Very little was, this was the situation in 1985, and what is hatched would be what needs to be demolished, so very little, and you could build a big mass which would pay royally for the uh, new buildings. Was published in blueprint or this was another proposal for Washington how to get rid of this horrendous uh, candy center and uh, uh, Moretti's Watergate and make a real place out of it with three concert halls instead of all in one building voila so that's what I wanted to show to <laughs> today apparently I heard now that the uh, Scofidio Dylan a project for the Museum of London site has been cancelled. And so there is still hope. <laughs> oh, there is again hope um, for London to get a real decent concert place. 
Okay. Um, well, I think that was worth the worth the effort, definitely. Um, How can I get rid of it? Stop share. Uh, unshare. There we go. Yeah. Unshare. Um, yeah. Um, no, it's interesting because you're, you're you're still doing sort of new things and and things that are um, are schemes, you know, without any. But I guess you know. I mean, do you find doing uh, things like that they they turn into things or or not? Well, usually they do, and this, I have very small organization. Nobody but myself. <laughs> I don't need that much work, but I have now for a year. I I have an uh, a partner, uh, Iranian partner Yamshit Seperi, who, with whom I have done projects since two thousand and seven, and we have now because we feel kind of an obligation towards uh, Iran, which is his country of origin, but he has been living in. In Washington, he's living in Washington, but he lived in uh, in uh, Abu Dhabi and in Shanghai and so on. Uh, <clears throat> but we always wanted to do something for Iran, and now we because we want to do to make a gift to Iran, which is free of charge. I mean, we sponsor it, and normally these things take a month or two. But we have now been on it for a year, and we are ready to launch. <laughs> <laughs> we may end up like your father <laughs> in Israel, you know, with our project, but you never know. We intended it for we intended for a small island in the Gulf, Persian Gulf, and uh, we are just launching it. We want to publish first in Iran and see what it how they react. But there is never any hope for it. I have done so many projects; they are like love stories, which are generally unrequited. But yeah. then you find another girl, you know. <laughs> um, I, 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 if anyone's got some questions, um, just um, put your hand up and I'll, I'll scan um, through and find them, or you can put them on the chat, which I will work out how to use. Um, I've got some questions in the meantime, which just I feel like asking, and I think they probably have... Um, Lots of, um, well, other people may be interested. Um, okay, just, just to start off, really basic question. You've probably been asked this a hundred times. Um, what got you into urban planning and architecture in the first place? Well, I grew up in, in Luxembourg City, which was a perfect city at the time. And uh, we didn't live in the center, but because Luxembourg is like an, a family of different quarters, which became actually the model of my, of my, for my philosophy. And we lived on a boulevard overlooking a canyon and overlooking the town. So it was, and I walked to this, to school across, you know, across the street. And I heard the bells. When I heard the bells in the schoolyard, I went from our garden to school. And then for the lycée, I went 20 minutes across town. But it was a perfect town. And then when that started to be, uh, I lived in Berlin at the time when I got newspapers from Luxembourg saying that park or parking, an article, saying that now the town center had been so overloaded that they needed to build gigantic car parks for all the uh, administrative and commercial jobs in town, which had been lost its population that they would cut down the park in order to have a um, huge car park uh, taking that place. Because the town, the, the town center was surrounded by three valleys on three sides and then a, a crescent of artificial walls in the 19th century, built in, in the 18th and 19th century, and taken down at the end of the century and, and replaced by parks. So the whole town was isolated by valleys and by park. And actually, um, when I got interested, when I saw this happening, I so panicked. I knew nothing about urbanism that I started to sketch out what could be done in Luxembourg. And actually, the newspapers, the newspaper had published that article of, uh, you know, park or parking, then published my, my, response with the sketch and this was early 70s 
and um, Pierre Vago had done the, the monster plan for Luxembourg, the zoning plan, uh, responded, who is this guy who comes from nowhere thinking that he knows anything about urbanism, you know. <laughs> and But then I got really interested and I, I was doing a competition for Paris for La Villette. So I studied Paris. idea of Cartier's and then Otto Wagner, particularly Otto Wagner and also the father of Elial Sarinen, of Vero Sarin, Elial Sarin had done a fantastic plan for uh, Helsinki in 1915, which theorized that if you grow a town, they should not be a center with suburbs, but you should multiply uh, the centers. It was like this polycentric model, which Otto Wagner had also in his project for Vienna called the Grenzen uh, Unendliche uh, Großstadt or something like that, a metropolis without limit. And that's often misunderstood because it looks like a boring grid. But every block in that grid means an urban quarter, like a Bezirk in, in, uh, in Vienna. <clears throat> then I found out that all large cities before mass transport were organized that way in parishes or riones or whatever different countries had different names and that's really what got me going that but also the experience with uh, i worked for three months on Rancon housing for jim sterling and to see that a man intelligent man talented man who was then the most famous architect in the world that he had absolutely no theory what <laughs> it should be. And he just got a, a program from Rancon and did it. And we knew in the office, this is going to be a disaster. Because we had like over 2000 housing units, many, I think about 60 urban blocks, so row houses, which were bent into L's or X's or any which way, which and he pretended that we were imitating <coughs> bath, bath terraces, bath uh, type of squares. It had nothing to do with it. Huh? So uh, at one point on, on Fridays, we had always like an, <coughs> a, an office jury. And uh, so I said, Le Corbusier, at least for the Villa Radius, he had two sections, one east-west and one north-south. But you have only one and it's going to be a disaster and he got furious and said you don't you don't get it and so on <laughs> and it became so horror i couldn't work on it so i said either you give get me another job or i leave and uh, so he got me to organize to, to do competitions he was invited to competitions so i took over the the office <clears throat> of competitions and because of that there was huge programs for I've ne never done a real serious program for, except the you know, university project competition, but to do a town for, for Siemens for 10,000 people for a research center, I thought this is a real urban problem. And he didn't know. I thought, I know very little. I had done kind of a linear city for Bielefeld once, but I knew this wouldn't be anything comparable to what I knew a real town had to be. And he's really out of the despair with, you know, with that there was no theory there. The best architect and the most known architect in the world had no clue about urbanism. And yet there was this confidence that this is a man who can, you know, who can plan the future. <clears throat> so I started really reading a lot more than Le Corbusier, as I used to. And Camilo Zito was really the main, the main discovery, all done in Arabia library. I went evenings or Saturdays to the I buy every Saturday to the Arabia, which was fantastic library. I don't know what's now, but it was. <clears throat> you still could hold first editions of Vitruvius and uh, Scamozzi. <laughs> now they are probably locked up, but you could above all look at all the magazines from 18, 1850s onwards, you know, whether it's Austrian or French or or English, <clears throat> and the most important for me were. The magazine, which was founded by uh, Camilo Zitte called Der Städtebau. He only ran it for two, two years, but then it was taken over by 
other people, but to a fantastic magazine with incredible urban projects. And that's where I learned. And then <clears throat> I knew we know very little. I had learned nothing at university. I mean, what do you learn in one year? I left before I could be completely brainwashed. But I couldn't learn that Sterling's Corbusier was dead. I mean, for me, it was dead as far as urbanism concerns. And the more I studied about urbanism in Italy, you know, there were a fantastic magazine called Urbanismo, something like that. And nothing. All the major architects or urbanists, they were just amateurs, huh? including people I, I admired, like Rossi or even partially Gregotti. But there was an interesting magazine called Controspazio in Italy, which was run by Portoghese, which published across the, the field. So, But even there, you there was a real embarrassment. There was no theory. There was a kind of, they called about, they talked about scientific urbanism, but the only one I could find that was not published, there was the, was really very th serious about, and which was right in the line of uh, Camillo Zitte or Otto Wagner or Stuben was Cervellati, was then the head of the historic center of uh, Bologna. And he had written a book about, um, I forget now the title, but it was a fantastically important book um, called like Tipologia e Morphologia della Città Storica, something like that. And I learned Italian because I felt this is really fundamental work. You know? And it was really fundamental for me. But then I discovered that when Cervellati was the head of, of architecture in Bologna, when he operated in the suburbs of Bologna, they they called Kenzo Tange and did horrible suburbs. And it was this conflict which really alarmed me. There is no theory. We need a theory. And uh, because for this Luxembourg article, when I criticized the Plan Vago for Luxembourg, I tried to find some something authoritative to quote, to could say this is the solution. That's what one has to follow. Because a, crit a critique is nothing if it is not also a proposal, if it's not followed by a proposal. As you are, I mean, I repeat things you all know and just from your own experience. But it was it was absolutely common that you would criticize and you would agree about criticizing, but there was no theory. Like now, there's a lot of criticism of politics, but there's no theory how we get out of this mess. You know, I mean, communism has collapsed on its own. And I always had this argument with uh, with Roger that you need to have a general theory of state and government in order to replace something like communism, because capitalism is going to, to run us into the wall as well, if we are not careful. And we are not careful. And that's what we are in now. We are into on, on an, uh, an avenue to totalitarian state like we have never seen like this plant has never seen before. And um, so that's what started me. And then once I had this theory in the grasp, I then was asked to teach at the AA and uh, I got unit master. And whoever I invited to lecture on urbanism, whether it was from Italy or from, from Zurich or from Paris, I just couldn't, couldn't find anyone to take seriously. So I didn't invite any more people. I took, I made all the lectures myself, always about the th a theme, a theme which once per week I would talk about typology or morphology or, uh, and so on, going right through architecture and urbanism, uh, <clears throat> what it meant traditionally and what it could possibly now. And then we applied this by analyzing London uh, and always had them analyze analyze uh, areas which had been badly developed, mainly uh, badly developed by, by the GLC, and then take down, you know, we would study the property lines over the last 200 years. And then for instance, finding out how much property lines, large property lines were incredibly important in shaping London geography. <laughs> like, for instance, we have almost no link between Camden and um, and beyond and or between Hampstead and Camden, for instance, uh, because there was a property line there. I think there are two 
a very narrow passes on like two kilometers or three kilometers of, of old fence, which is now, you know, they're just cul-de-sacs ending on both sides. <clears throat> I think actually a man had understood that in the, in the GLC, we then started to make more connections, but this was, I'm talking about 1975. And, but how to dezone these areas in London, which have been suburbanized by, by or which were already suburban in nature, and then were even more destroyed by, by the GLC. And then we would take down all the fences and all the low buildings and then try to uh, maintaining all buildings which were higher than two or three floors and then build a f urban fabric around them. And all this was, I published them in, in Japan for, you know, and that was, it really worked for a theory. And then I applied this for two or three years, we exercised this and then I applied this to my hometown of Luxembourg, where there was a big opposition against European uh, Parliament building development. There, the atmosphere was ripe for an alternative. And my friend Maurice Culot was the head of the Archive d'Architecture Moderne in Brussels. He co-sponsored that and uh, published a book about it. And we had a lot of publicity in Luxembourg, but of course, nothing happened. Huh? I got later. I was near. I nearly became the director of the. European quarters, but then didn't go through Parliament, I think. Uh, but all the projects I did who were always like bottles into the sea, they were always picked up somewhere else. And for instance, I had done a plan for the town I went to, to the Lycée. I hated school, but I loved the town and the landscape. And the park was absolutely fantastic. And most of it had been rebuilt after the war. So I did a project for the extension of the school. There was competition, but I didn't respect the competition briefs, which were ridiculous and were not in the right spot. I did like a project, how that town could grow. And then I discovered that all this rebuilding of that place of Ashtonach was done in artisan manner between 1947 and 1954. They rebuilt a huge basilica and the whole town more beautiful than it was before. So I had proof that artisan construction can be extremely rapid, was much more rapid than the rebuilding of French towns, which neighbored to Luxembourg, where we, when we drove through France, we were always crying, what do the French do to their towns? I mean, people living in boxes. And they came, you know, they were all built with the Camus system, prefabricated system, which was a copy, or I think even the Soviet Union bought that system. They were prefabricated slums. Huh? And um, and then no, I tell that story because I did a drawing for the Triennale in 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 uh, Milan, which was published a lot. <clears throat> and then five years later, I got a huge project in Bel in in Bremen for the Senate to do a plan for the whole town center. And I asked Kurenkamp, the uh, Senate director, why did you invite me? Because you no. Know, I always am interested why I'm getting invited. He said, well, you did this beautiful project for Ashtonach, this fantastic drawing. And I said, but that was fantasy. He said, I don't care. <laughs> We're going to do it. But then nothing happened or, uh, because there's always a lot of opposition, as you all know, to, to these projects. But something happened around the world because, uh, you know, people, many people like me who had grown up in beautiful environments had the same feeling that something went amiss and dared to, to oppose. And this became a major movement. And, you know, the thing is that we know, <coughs> we build a general theory, which is shared in America and even in Thailand and in, uh, in Malaysia and wherever you go, there are these new urban projects or traditional urban projects. But they are never government projects. They're always done because some individual uh, developer is convinced that an individual architect, <laughs> whether his diploma or not, is doing the right thing. And they always uphill struggles to get them done. And you never do them um, the way you, you would really want them to be done technologically and, and also legislatively. But at least we get something done, which I think disproves all the theories uh, about the opposition to traditional urbanism, which says that it's philosophically wrong, it's technologically wrong, it's financially wrong, it's economically disaster, it's, and you shouldn't do it. Huh? 
uh, and architects and craftsmen are no longer able to do this kind of work, which is all along the line is lies. And I think we are proving that. So even if the projects we do are never really completely the way we want to do it, but at least they are, you know, a foot in the in the door towards the right direction. And that's really where I think philosophy is behind, because we have we have a counter project which works, which we know if we apply that generally in every single country, whether it's in Japan or in China or in South America or in Europe or in the United States, it's the right model. We have solutions for every budget and for every scale. And if that was generalized, it would be better, much better than what is happening now. But this does not exist. This counter project is neither doesn't exist on the religious, on the philosophic, on the political level, on the economic level. There are no counter projects. And that's why we are now victims to this takeover which is a world, I think we are in, in a situation of a coup d'etat, <clears throat> a worldwide coup d'etat, which is installing a society which is the worst, not even, not even 1984 or Aldous Huxley could imagine this. And step, and st step after step, it's going the, the wrong direction, under false pretenses, under pretenses of science, science. The science tells us it's no science at all, it's all politics. Do you so are you quite pessimistic about your influence? Do you think that the ideas of people like you and Andreas Duani, do you, do you feel generally you're you're being ignored or do you think you're getting traction? No, I I mean I was never I I'm not ambitious in that sense. I'm extremely ambitious on the theoretical sense, but I was not strong enough to to implement, you know, and but people like Duani or, I mean, you, you know, you do things I couldn't do. Uh, <clears throat> and Duani has, he has done over 200 projects, which are, have all under construction. You don't know them because they don't get published. Huh? Mm -hmm. But there's often very good work. For instance, we had together a project in, in, <clears throat> in Knokke, in Belgium, you know, you, nobody has ever heard of this we abandoned after two years i did the architecture for a year and, and he took over after i had given up but he gave also up because the mayor of knocker count lippens he was not strongly be, he was not like the prince he was not strongly enough behind it i abandoned but then the people who had been most opposing the project there was a revolution within in ghent within the regional government and a man took charge uh, with an architect who had been trained by Maurice Culot and to help me on the project in 1918 for Berlin for Tegel. And they have done a marvel. I mean, it's just as good as, it's not, not any worse than Poundbury. And totally without control, I mean, without our interference, which is the incredible strength of traditional models like Flanders or Dorset or wherever you go in Europe, you have strong local traditions which you can draw upon. And with sensitive minds or intelligent architects, you can immediately, you to, if you go to Bavaria, you find no architects doing the right thing. But you have in almost in every village, you have fantastic builder doing perfect carpentry and, and good stonework. Uh, <clears throat> you know, in Dresden, Frankfurt, Berlin, where there are now these reconstructions, massive reconstructions. Uh, this was said is impossible because there's no craftsmanship left. No, when you do these projects, you know, your father knows, uh, everyone involved in this, the craftsmen come with you. You always find the right people. You may not get the hundred percent, but sometimes you get even more than you expect when you have good craftsmen. So uh, I think we can save our corner, but I don't think it will be a world revolution where we will triumph. Politics are not ready. And what is happening now is a triumph of corporate fascism. You know, what Mussolini exercised with Italian corporate corporations uh, is now being applied worldwide. <clears throat> it's a new form of fascism called anti-fascism, <laughs> Black Lives Matter and all this nonsense. And it's so extraordinary that under the perverted use of names, 
they are doing now the 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 the, the thing all in the name of goodness and uh, saving lives and all this nonsense. No? I'm not optimistic. I think one has to. What one can do is to get this, because I think we are the the few people who have very satisfactory life, despite you know you don't get everything done which you want to do, but but we all have fantastic jobs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, one thing just on that, I mean, I'd just be really interested to know your attitude um, to uh, modernism, um, because you obviously aren't. You know, looking at your work, you aren't someone who just completely would like to be in the 18th century. There is something quite progressive about your designs or or, or novel, yet they are kind of rooted in traditionalism. And and you are quite a fan of the Corbusier's villas. Mm. Am, am I wrong there? <laughs> so, so I'm just interested to know where you where you where you sit on that. Um, no, because I, I was. I was brought up in modernism. I gr I grew up in a beautiful town, and uh, I had a brief. Uh, I was writing little stories, and my teacher in the lycée sent these in for a competition, and I got a big prize. And I bought for that prize, I bought the oeuvre complete of Corbusier. But then, the more I found out, uh, I thought, and I started to doing projects for Luxembourg in the Corbusier, and I thought. I mean, it's going to destroy the town. No? So, but to go there from a first feeling of something is wrong, to really know what to do, took another ten years. No? Mm. But uh, I have been living with this for because Corbusier is an interesting fellow. I'm publishing. I've worked on this for for, I mean, ever since I was a child. No? And we are publishing now <clears throat> a big book, which is the ninth volume of Le Corbusier's oeuvre complete. Corbusier published six, two were published after his death, and now comes the ninth volume, which is the solution. Is Corbusier translated, corrected, and complemented? <laughs> because if there is something interesting in Le Corbusier, you can find those elements in traditional architecture worldwide. And therefore, I use his most interesting buildings, the buildings where there is really something powerful, like the Villa Savoie, or the chapel in Ronchamp, there's also something you don't like, but there's something happening. You feel this is not just the other <laughs> stupid modernist statement. There's something. And so I translate these into traditional technology and natural building materials. That is one side. The other one is I want to demonstrate that not only were they, was modernism uh, a poor theory, urbanistically didn't count was anti-urbanism was sprawl you know suburbia writ large geographically writ large writ large but that they didn't even do what they could have done which was actually in paris there's a small street called rue Malais de Vins. do you know it it's it's 200 meters from corbusier's foundation there's an a cul de sac designed in 1923 and 2025 by an architect called Mallet Stevens, Mallet Stevens, like an English name, Mallet Stevens. And he was he was an amateur uh, student of Otto Wagner. He published the first 10 years during the First World War. He published drawings which looked like exactly like from Josef Hoffmann or the Otto Wagner Schule, you know, the school of Otto Wagner. And then he, in the early 20s, he became modernist, ship style modernist. Uh, he was actually the first, one of the first, on the same date than Le Corbusier. They, they, you know, they were basically influenced by naval architecture, by marine architecture. I traced all their, their style, goes back to boats you, which were being built in England or Switzerland in 1880. Direct references. So I identified. Uh, four styles. One was the classical style, which Corbusier was not very good at, and then the the ship style, which he was okay. I mean, did beautiful buildings, very badly built, but very elegant, beautifully proportioned, and very pleasant, if it doesn't rain. Uh, and then the steel and steel and glass, and then concrete after nineteen forty five, 
And the interesting thing is that he was an organized fascist. He was he he worked in Vichy for two years, but then gave up because there was no chance that his modernism would win. There were interesting regionalists in, who were who had more the saying. So he gave that up, and then he went back to Paris. Had lost his partner, his cousin, Pierre Jeanre, who had been a communist. They they quarrelled, but then he got the most important job of his life by Claudius Petit, who had been in the French resistance against Vichy, and he became minister of construction. He gave him the of minister of the, uh, development and construction. And he gave him the job in Marseille and later in Firmini, you know, the, where he built a church and the stadium. And so it's very, very contradictory. So the, the modernist, brutalist style came exactly from Atlantic Wall, the Nazi Atlantic Wall built by um, forced labor. So it's ironic. I mean, it's doubly, tragically ironic that modernism, and I always ask Peter Benham, Rainer Benham, why why he called his book New Brutalism? I said, it's by chance because the old brutalism was the Atlantic Wall, and he, he kind of, he smiled, he didn't <laughs> confirm. <laughs> and Jim, of course, didn't know, Sterling didn't know. Uh, so there's this strange link between Nazism, Fascism, Socialism, and Communism, and Modernism, but it's not seen as guilty. Whereas uh, Speer confirmed, I mean, I, I really uh, talked to him a lot about this. He said, even if we had won the war, modernism would have won by 1953. But with the disappearance of Hitler, modernism would have won anyway. And Hitler was modernist because actually his last big projects he permitted. He didn't make uh, Tessenov win the competition for in Rügen, which was five kilometer long. Uh, resort for Kraft durch Freude, you know, summer resort for workers. But he made win a man called Klotz, who was a modernist, huh? five kilometer long building. In incredible. Against Tessenov. Uh, Speer wanted Tessenov to win, but Hitler didn't want because it was too backward looking, according to, to him. <laughs> so. That is interesting, the kind of ideological content, because uh, you, you're right, there, there were lots of fascist um, modernists, well, like the Taregni building, Taregni, yes, yes. Um, which is actually universally praised, but um, mm. obviously classical had this, um, this legacy through Spear and so on, which... Yeah. Um, but yeah. there's, a, there's a book called uh, Bauhaus, Im Dritten Reich, Bauer's in Third Reich, many of the architects who came from Mies, Mies stayed himself in Third Reich until 38 because he expected that Hitler would recognize him as the great architect he thought he was. Mm. But Hitler thought nothing of, of he used Mies style uh, architecture for factories, for the Oranienburg, uh, the Heinkel right. uh, factories are, are the best Mies ever built, but by man called Trimpel who, who was doing the style of Mies. Mm -hmm. So it's it's very strange how far that historiography has still not or is only slowly the only one who really discussed this correctly was was David Watkin but there are very few people there are now young people catching up. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, the, the Pavsana history of modern art is still dominating the most uh, most schools. Huh? It, it's a weird thing in a way i mean i think in a way french architecture which is, on the one hand was the most kind of modernist and progressive and sort of still is on one hand i mean it, I've, I've i've got french friends and i describe what i do uh you know i design old buildings you know now and they just they just in, in hysterics they just think it's the funniest thing <laughs> they've ever heard but if you wanted to design a building in the french alps They've got a regulation of yes. the pitch of the roof, how big the eaves should be. Provence, Bordeaux, everywhere. And I mean, in a way, it's quite funny. I think it's very typically French somehow that they look like they're one thing, but um, they're, they're something the, very different. The, the only thing which saves France, I lived there for 20 years, and so I know a bit about France. The only thing which saves France is their monumental hypocrisy. Yes. That 
uh, for during the week they are in Paris, wild militant modernists, and then on the weekend they go to Dordogne to their cottage. <laughs> <laughs> all of them. I know that I knew them all, yeah. I, including Mitterrand. You know, he was the biggest hypocrite, and um, an ex-fascist. In yeah. fact, he worked for Vichy you know, for two years, um, becoming then socialist after the war. Um, no, but it's still not openly debated. I only, for instance, to this afternoon, the first time I, I had a man in Germany who, who, who quoted me along with David Irving and Roger Scruton as, I mean, in order to make us look guilty of denials, which we never did, and of <laughs> accusing us of racism, which we never were. Well, I think we are all racist anyway. But it's a way how one lives with one one's racism and how you civilize your own feelings. So this whole thing that you could not be racist is just a lie, because your feeling tells you every day otherwise. You know, that you are profoundly you are you are prejudiced about race whether you want it or not, and this whole poli politics of trying to change that. The only thing is good manners. And, and decent behavior which can civilize it, but not anti-racism, it's just the wrong attitude. But anyway, France is, is uh, there's a lot of fantastic things happening in France, but they never get published. Mm. I mean, there, there are a lot of good arch traditional architects in France, but they never get published. Uh, I mean, even the entire, the, the French new town, well, Ali is doing a lot of building in, in uh, have you been asked to do work there? Uh, me, no. Um, but I, I think it's the problem with the history of art or mm. architecture is the history of what is seminal rather mm. than the history of what is good. And yes. that's how things are judged. Like, uh, you know, I think for the RBA Awards, it's how innovative is something. But, sure. you know, there's good innovation and bad innovation. Most of it's bad, other, other, you know, because it, it dies a death. Um, but it's interesting, there is this kind of you're not looking for something good, you know. No. It's not for good architecture. Well, also, it's a, it's a pretense to be innovative when you, I mean, it's just innovative to the ignorant. But if you know about form, you know exactly where the things come from. Yeah, it's always yeah. imitative. Even the you know the SR fifty one, the, the fastest plane in the world, is uh, uh, is imitated from something. Sure, sure. Um, and it's this ignorance which cultivates an idea which has absolutely no value. And, uh, uh, yeah, and, and, and combined with um, this idea about zeitgeist, wanting to show your yeah. age. Uh, was it you who said, um, trying to, um, zeitgeist is like uh, body odor? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Was it you? I think it was. You can't, uh, you can't, you cannot not be in the zeitgeist. It's if not you something tried. you want, necessarily. Um, you are in the zeitgeist whether you want it or not. Yeah, and, and in a way, yeah, I mean, this is, we, we sometimes in planning, we have to do, the, like the planners say, oh, I want this to look like a farmyard, or I want this to look like that, or they sort of don't like the, the story that's happening. Yeah. They, they change the story <laughs> to, um, uh, you know, they don't like the idea that actually the story is that the farm was no longer economic, and someone rich decided they'd come along and build a house. That's not a story they want. But, it's, <laughs> you know, that is the story. And that is more true than anything. You know, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, yeah, interesting one. I've got a few questions. Um, someone has very patiently had their hand up for a long time. Uh, Eugene Doughty, uh, what was your question? Do you want to unmute yourself? Good. Yeah, uh, thanks, Francis. Uh, hello, Leon. Uh, it's hello. Eugene from PG Fries, who we've worked with on Pinebury. Um, oh, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I was interested um, uh, to hear you say that you did your last, the, the master plan that you showed us for free. At least I think that's what you said. Um, and I think that's quite common, isn't it, on major developments where the master plan is done free. Um, now, given that I work for a developer, um, <laughs> we can't get anybody to work for free. All our plumbers and carpenters want to be paid. 
Um, but so I just wondered what was your view on that? If maybe that's a good thing that it gets more input, more people are willing to contribute and maybe it gets the best answer at the end of the story or does it indicate that designers are totally undervalued and that's why the country is covered in, at least in the UK, with horrendous housing developments. No, I don't. That would be misunderstanding. I don't work for free. I, I work for free. I sponsor projects which I choose myself, not, and usually they don't have a client. When I work for a developer on, on authority, or I, I get paid because I have to live. I mean, I, I'm not... <laughs> I don't have silver. Sp I didn't grow up in no. a silver spoon. No, but I do. Uh, I noticed that I started to do competitions in the late 60s and 70s and usually found that competitions are the wrong brief already. You do competitions for 10,000 housing units or a gigantic uh, university campus where there is nothing but but the offices or laboratories so that often the competitions are already wrongly programmed. And uh, so then I noticed that when you do a competition, you can't get published because there are 200 other projects who want to get published. So I did projects which I thought needed really, uh, were, could become good examples to, you know, which had already an object like Washington DC or the European uh, quarters in Luxembourg, they had already a lot of attention. And then when you do a project, you do it for free. I, because I didn't have an office, I didn't have uh, employees. So I could sometimes work, I earned enough, I never earned much, but I could earn enough to sometimes work free for two years. And then somehow these drawings were sold in a gallery in New York and so on. In, I got income later, it worked out so far. Thanks God, never earned anything with publishing, but anyway, only very recently. So no, you, because if you work for free, you also, it lacks, it lacks really respect. And, and you are seen like comp an unfair competition. But when you do a project for an area where nobody thinks of doing it, I mean, I do now a project with my partner for an island in the Persian Gulf and there's no competition. We just do this a gift to the country, do the right thing, don't do like Dubai or, or Doha, but rediscover your own roots. Persia was the best architecture in the world. I mean, they influenced, you know, Persian architecture has influenced India and Spain and all around the, 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 the Gulf and the, and the Mediterranean. Incredible influence, positive influence. And to revive that and Iran is a fantastic country with fantastic people, enormous culture, the first great empire in the world. And why should we treat them like they want the bomb and so they are guilty? We have damn atomic bombs, why shouldn't they? Then a big country, they have nearly 100 million people. Um, and so to, to break through that uh, diplomatic barrier and do something you know, to reestablish contacts, and uh, and also because <clears throat> projects we do is a love affair. Our work is the best work you can do. I mean, we have so much fun. Even if we didn't get paid, it gets paid later. If you publish it, you get somebody gets interested. So it always, uh, I mean, it's not secure income, but if you are healthy, you can do it. And uh, so, no, you should never work for free for an authority. That would be bad because then no, they think it comes free. I did that in the village I lived in France and was just ended in the basket. <laughs> but did we work together? Uh, yes, on Pinebury. On, on what part? On the first um, part? Well, all of it. Uh, phase one up until the current sectors. Did you work on the, because I know, I remember you, you were doing a building to replace the building by John Simpson, no? Uh, the the, arches, old, the yeah, red brick. That was that was Morish, I think. Ah, uh, Morish. Yeah, yeah. And you work with fries, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I I, I would have known, but but yeah, they are. Yeah. We met a few times. But. Yeah, yeah, but they are. You know, we chose to have only small builders to start with. Yeah. It was absolutely the right, and that was the prince's idea, 
And it's only when we sold land to the uh, big company, I forget what it was called, but it was taken over by Pride, forget now, Primrose. Yeah, one of the unnamed PLCs. Well, it's really a poor uh, Peter John Smythe. He was yeah. mistreated. His plans were thrown in the basket. And we found out too late to correct it. No. Yeah. It's really the area which is not good. No. Yeah. On the other hand, there's so good experience. And now the latest buildings, I don't know when you have been there, but it's fantastic. Ben, Ben, Ben Treath and, and George. Yeah, I, th I think the good thing is we, we've got a, a we've got a drawing office with 20 people in it. And all of them have now got experience of working yeah, yeah, on traditional true. architecture. Yes, yeah. But they would never have had. Huh? <laughs> They're all experts in traditional detailing. That yeah. you wouldn't get in a lot of um, the private practices just, in the UK. Quality is stunning. Huh? Yeah, yeah, no, it's contradicting everything which modernists say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Now, when they go, they can't really say it's bad, so they say, "Oh, it's not as bad as I expected." <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But they had this thing with intelligence squared at the university, <laughs> Minster, and and. Uh, the the harsh critic was Michael uh, Michael Wilford, who was uh, Sterling's partner. We used to be friends, but then he was rather aggressive. So I asked him, "But Michael, have you been to Poundbury?" He said, "No, I was on the bypass." I said, "Well, you should have driven in because you know it's like judging a film from the poster because it's really <laughs> compared to what we we used to do in." In a Gloucester place, it's quite remarkable, technically too. <laughs> I think I think what I find remarkable is that we build two hundred and fifty thousand rubbish houses in the UK every year, and we build probably a thousand good houses in Poundbury, and Poundbury gets more press than all the others. Yeah. <laughs> well, George's houses, I don't know whether you built them. No, George. Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. Well, they got the best, they had like an enormous approval rate mm. on the British scale, on the mm -hmm. country scale. Mm. That's interesting. Great. Mm. Well, well, nice to see you again. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks, Liam. Why do you have a yellow hand? You are on mute, Francis. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, I've got a, a question from um, um, Ira. Bandes, who says, how can we design certain architectural typologies, such as airports, for example, following references to traditional classical architecture? What's your, your view on, on new types? Well, well the, <laughs> the, best, the best airport in the world is on our Persian Gulf Island. I can show it to you <laughs> if you want. You want to see it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I take a minute. Hang on, multiple shares. Yes, you can do it. You can, you can do it now. Um, how can I do this? Wait, wait, wait. But I, my answer to that would be uh, something like the McKim Meaden White um, Station in New York, Pennsylvania, yeah. station, which was a Roman bath um, and made an excellent train station. That's fantastic. Yeah. Wait, I have, I just show you one image, which gives you an idea of where the planes land. Can you see it? I can't. I need to share the screen. You should, you should be able to share the screen. You need to, yeah, share the screen again. It's, it's a runway which crosses the whole island. It's just one kilometer across and then it has this airport at one end. <clears throat> you land between two arcades, which are influenced by the big bridge in, in Isfahan, and then you the planes stop under this gigantic umbracolo, you know, which is just shading the the area. And um, can you see it? No. no. I would say, Leo, the best airport that I ever went to uh, was St. Petersburg. Oh, I didn't know it. And uh, well, they demolished it. Unfortunately, oh. it was a an, uh, 1950s airport. It had a barrel vault, 
Oh. Uh, and in the tympanum, they had a, a, a painting of people looking at planes flying overhead. It was brilliant, oh. but it's oh, gone yes. now. They, they, well, they demolished it. It was a, a Stalinist thing. Yeah, it was 1950s. It was, it was oh. really nice. But of course, you know, they wanted to get rid of that stuff, so. Well, obviously, 19th century train stations were a great model for yeah. you know, solving the technological, technical problem of, of large spaces using a lot of glass, whether it's St. Pancras or, or Paris stations or the Penn pen, pen station in, in New York. So th there are great models. The problem is that those, those jobs, they never, you don't get these. Huh? I mean, even your office who could uh, handle such a thing, you don't even get asked. Huh? No. Um, and that will take another more time. Huh? Because that is the whole point, which I, I try to always to make. We live in democracy, maybe not for much longer. <laughs> but, you know, and democracy has been the worst to architecture ever. Architecture was... Uh, living on the margins, those who did real architecture, like Quinn or you or uh, the people who did good work, they were always operating on the margins and uh, all for very rich clients. Huh? And then you get accused of working only for the rich, but you would also work for the poor if you had the choice. Huh? Uh, and so for that to revert, that for that to become democratic, I think we are now getting even away from it because you know, with the totalitarian state as being installed now, we d I don't think we'll stand a chance huh? uh, because we don't have really a way to defend ourselves. And unfortunately, I think Prince Charles is now more on to climate change than architecture. I hope not. But uh, you know, it's not something which Davos is interesting, a subject of what we are doing is not of no interest to big corporate, except Curiously, except to Disney, who you know, who do this marvelous project in uh, did in Orlando and uh, celebration, and also the Paris project is really getting better and better. And Ali can tell us about it. Huh? Has Ali talked about it? Because he's doing a big part. Or Dimitri did a lot of work there. Pierre Carlo Bontempi does a lot of work, and um, so it's a big ex counter example. There are several in France, but they don't get publicity. That's the that's the problem. Um, well, when the first airport will be built in that way, I don't see I don't see it coming. Well, I had a question. Sorry, um, sorry. from uh, Jan. Um, Jan, you said you had a question. I I, I actually do. Um, uh, hello, Leo. Hello, Jan. <laughs> I just sort of, you know, when you were talking earlier on about the sort of et etymology, if you like, of modernism uh, and its roots in a kind, in a, you know, call it communism and fascism, they're much the same thing at the end of the day. Uh, it's about the society and the good of the whole rather than the individual. Um, and uh, when I was, you know, 20, 30 years ago, I used to think that uh, the kind of the, the end of modernism was nigh and, and, uh, and traditional design would come be accepted very easily because all you just had to do was do good work and people would automatically uh, flock to it as being a much better solution and that includes uh, Leo's work on, on urbanism and it, and it hasn't happened um, and um, at the risk of sounding crazy um, and the, the, the discussion about politics is, is quite interesting because um, the more I've been kind of going back on things um, the whole sort of post first world war uh, agenda of the of the um, of the Bolsheviks was um, one of destabil. They, they they couldn't understand why Bolshevism didn't trans didn't transfer across Europe because it was such a great idea, um, and they came to the conclusion that that people were too wedded to their traditions and to their culture, uh, and they had it on the agenda to um, to undermine that. And and the most the most um, um, there was an Italian called Gramsci who, who uh, and I think it was a, it was a, sure. a phrase was called by called, was uh, was coined by Rudy Dutschka, um, and and it was called uh, the journey something like the journey through the institutions, the march through the institutions. Yes, yes. And I, I'm sort of starting to wonder 
whether the resilience of modernism and 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 its kind of um, solid base in the kind of, in the in the ruling elite is is really a part. You know, I mean, it sounds crackers, but uh, to undermine people's uh, environment is probably the most um, profitable undermining that you can do. Uh, so when people are, and, and the idea was that once people are kind of discombobulated and lost in what they actually stand for, what they like, what they what they want, they become consumers, uh, and they're much more easily manipulated. And I do sort of wonder whether there's an element of this. I mean, we're sort of, as, as Leo says, we're, we're sort of reaching the end game now, where we don't even know what 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 sex was supposed to be anymore. <laughs> be very small. And and did this did this start in architecture? And this is why modernism is proving so resilient because it's part of a kind of global idea of of uniting people in this bizarre way through architecture and art. It's the same all over the world. Um, I don't know how the I don't know how you'd sustain a conspiracy like that for this many years, but it just has, it seems to it feels like one. I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts about that. Well, I just wrote a piece on democracy and architecture, mm-hmm. which exactly discusses that problem that in a way happen, is happening now to politics, what mm-hmm. happened to architecture with the Second World War. I mean, there was a first a break with uh, you know, a changing society from producers into consumers massively, not just uh, the, the odd class, but the whole of society is now becoming uh, no longer producers. Production is going to be uh, ex-located to China, where I have visited factories in China and, you know, it's they are, they are basically prison camps where people work. They don't even look at you. The workers, even where they produce good furniture, they don't dare look you in the eye. They are like really uh, subjected uh, and um, and that's an interesting thing. It's difficult to, for us to understand what can Silicon Valley and these huge corporate uh, uh, bodies, what can be the interest to run down the world economy? Because only shambles. Destroying the middle class and, the, and the whatever is left of local economy, uh, what can the interest be? Or what can be the interest of, of Germany to, to have a million and a half of immigrants from war zones, which we help to, which we feed, which we bombard, which we help to, 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 to flee. Yeah. Uh, and you no, know, but destabilization of, of society, reducing uh, uh, the cost of, of, of labor, of the little slave labor there is left, because m- much of it will be done by, by robots. So it's a gigantic scheme. It's, an, it's a real plot. What happened to architecture, to architectural education, to architectural representation was a coup d'etat, which was instituted under fascism and then realized after the war. And classism was just out. I mean, it was just some froth on top of a burgeoning industrial totalitarianism. Mm -hmm. And now that after the war that was gotten rid of, we lived in a kind of pseudo democracy uh, for 40 years, but which was or 60 years, which for us was comfortable, was great. I mean, we were lucky to, to live a period, at least in Europe, of being you know, relatively, you could speak what you wanted. Now you get cut. You know, if you say these things, I don't know whether you want to go on YouTube, but yeah. you know, we're going to be censored. But, but now this is happening to politics. Yeah. So there's no more opposition in Parliament. Anything conservative is even uh, in Germany, for instance, if you publish, I publish in a conservative uh, magazine there, and that's considered an absolute to be a fascist, to publish in the best magazine, which is called Cato, which is run by uh, a man who is half Jewish, thanks God, because so at least they cannot treat him as an anti-Semite, <laughs> but because he's conservative and he's even Catholic, or oh, he, 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 he became Catholic recently. Uh, it's considered like uh, fascists. And you know, even to be, have right leanings, conservative leaning is considered to be anti-democratic. Whereas democracy is supposed to be of left, center and right. If you have no right, you have one party system. Yeah. 
So that's what's happening now. And the, the anyway, cultural policy also of the Conservative Party in England, except for some except, exception instances like Roger becoming, Roger Scruton becoming head of this commission. But that's totally exceptional. And see what he had to live through. I mean, killed him in the end. Yeah. Yeah. The funny thing is the, lang the language used against um against the kind of the the, the, the woke organizations if you want to call it that it, but basically they're the children of the frankfurt school who, who might who, would, who went over to california and were teaching these are the grandchildren of their people they taught at that yeah. time uh, and the language is the same you know that it's not tolerant you know they call for it's an and it's they're calling for tolerance but that's the last thing they want to grant anybody who opposes them and yeah. we all get the same thing in the architectural world where, oh, yes, we're going to have diversity and all the rest of it. But the only diversity that's, that we can't have is the diversity of thought. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and yet, so, so we have this fake diversity of skin color that, that means <laughs> nothing, you know. Um, but as long as everyone's thinking the same way, it's okay. And, and, um, and, and, and traditional work is, is it's not so much... I mean, it's ignored, but it's also damned. I mean, the, the experience that, Ro that Roger had when he when he got that government position was so was potentially so dangerous to the establishment thinking that they had to destroy him. Of course, uh, and they, they will do yeah. that. If you rise too much prominence, you will be destroyed. Yeah, because you will be. Well, you were accused of you know with your spear book of all sorts of heinous things, and everyone ignored the book. You know. Um, yes, because yeah. it was it was a it was a personal ad hominem attack, and 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 this is used now politically against people who you don't like what they say. Um, it was funny because that campaign started a month after it was known and published in English papers that I I was designing the extension for National Gallery for the trustees. Mm. Then started this campaign as if by chance. No, but not by, it's nothing by chance, is it? And that's no. suspicious. And the book was not out yet. Huh? Yeah, yeah. And uh, which led to the resignation of David Alford, who was meant to build my building, and um, and I went into I couldn't work anymore because it was, you know, I lost all. When you when you get accused of such something so scandalous, there is no way you can defend yourself. Huh? Yeah. And Roger, I thought it was interesting when this happened with Roger, because it was different, because this time, if anyone gets accused, you can look on the web, what is this guy about? And there were, at the time he was being attacked, there was about, you could listen to 40 hours of Rogers talking about all subjects, from music to politics to whatever, urbanism, and you could find out for yourself what this guy is about. Yeah. But now even that is getting cut from from the web. Yeah. Well, the thing is that most uh, there's uh, it's the old tactic of disinformation. I mean, um, yeah. that you you know you if you Twitter some stuff out, it just has to be a few lines and it's picked up and it's distributed amongst you know for someone to go in and look at what Roger Scruton was about in some detail takes an effort. And we don't we don't live we live in a in a world where it, it's lies are tweeted straight to your phone. Mm -hmm. uh, and you don't have the, you don't even know where to look to, you know, you just accept it all. Yeah. Uh, and, and in the same way that, you know, students of architecture accepted modernism as if it was fed from, you know, from a holy fountain. And somehow, uh, and I remember being laughed at, and you know, in, in the School of Architecture, um, of because yeah. it was just so ridiculous, you know, as, as, as France is saying, that you design uh, new buildings in an, in uh, in an old in an old way and uh, you can't you can't be right uh, however good you are you, yeah, are, you can't, you can't be, be right, right. And, and that's what i'm saying i used to think that it was just a question of doing good quality work but clearly not no no i remember always an incredible scene uh, briefly after you liam liam o'connor he did uh, he did his thesis with uh, dimitri and um and i was his thesis uh, tutor and he did an airport for uh, for Venice beautiful design but there was something in the functioning which I thought would catch the attention of the jury and destroy him I said be careful because the functioning of there is not you know, could attract a lot of flack you know what happened they never looked at the project they immediately destroyed the style at the poly, mm. and 
that took us by surprise. I mean, he couldn't not even explain the scheme. The, the, you know, the bombardment started straight away. Yeah. And so, you know, what, I mean, that's not democracy. Democracy is about, uh, supposed to be about a debate of mature, yet contradictory theories, which have different visions, but work under the uh, protection of a common of a constitution and respect each other. And no, we don't get that kind of respect. We have a small group and I think we are still happy now because this may very well end in the near future because I, I expect now after this year of lockdown, uh, it has already started on YouTube who cut even the most uh, fantastic scientists and so on who get just blackballed. Huh? But I think that will happen more and more. All under, now it's under, under climate change. Huh? Because yeah. that's the new fascism is, is coming in under climate change. That's why I'm partic particularly scared because there's no science there. I mean, you know, the climate change theories, they are widely going apart. And there's absolutely no agreement. And the UN uh, agreement on climate change is not scientific. It's just political. I mean, this whole story about carbon, we have to build carbon free cities. It's absolute bullshit. You cannot build a town without producing carbon. And anyway, you need carbon is needed by the whole chlorophyllic process of nature need carbon to produce you no know, produce oxygen. Uh, and it's there are scientists, but they are being denounced as being paid by the petrol industry. It's complete lies. Ultimately, the um, you, you feel as if it, 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 uh, as if, uh, if, for instance, we, we all, those of us that build have a, a bit of enormous bad experience of the planning system, which is all about the bureaucrats microscopically controlling what you can build, what you can't build, which kind of window they like, and all the rest of it. Who gave them this right, you know? Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but, but, we, but the whole thing is now being translated into a societal one where, you know, climate change or COVID or whatever is the, you know, the excuse du jour. Um, is 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 the mandate for my for micromanagement of the population? Yeah, and I, yeah, yeah. They probably know that they've got most of the population in a, to a place where they can do that because nobody knows anything about anything anymore. And um, it's already it's already done because this whole masquerade is is just a scandal. It's an attack on 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 the global health. Yeah. To force people to wear a mask is disgusting. I I refuse to wear it. But, uh, but then you can't enter an, an aeroplane. You can't, yeah. Well, I, I just pretend to wear it in, in the aeroplane, but otherwise you don't, you don't travel. I only wear it because my wife tells me off. No, the hypocrisy is just monumental. People know it's bad. It doesn't help you to protect yourself at all. Now, even with people getting the, the damn jab, there's so much damage done by this jab. You know that Trios died the day or a few days after he got the jab. No. Right. And, and a lot of people, when you look at the UK column, they, they really run the, the numbers, which the MHA, what is called M and H, you know, the government itself publishes these documents of the side effects and the death of the jab. They are published by the government, but it's very difficult to find in the, in the labyrinth of the web. But these people at UK column do, and they have now their own green, uh, yellow card where you can see the enormous amount of death, not just in England, but also in the United States, everywhere. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's a crime against humanity. Yeah? And I, I completely refuse to, to have it. The only difference is it's more expensive to travel because you need all these uh, stupid, yeah. worthless tests, yeah. which cost much more than the jab. Much more than the journey. <laughs> but it's, 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 uh, it's healthier. No, things well, are not good, but at least we have great jobs still. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, do you, do you think the COVID pandemic uh, will have, how do you think that will affect architecture and town planning long term? Well, of course, now you hear all architects talking about post-COVID, but you know, not realizing that it's all in, in a pretense to install a totalitarian state. It's, um, it's, not, it's not a health issue. COVID is, an, is a fabrication which is used to, to lock up people 
I mean, we were for four months locked up in, in my own project in Guatemala. And in, in that whole time of four months, there were, I think, 30 dead, of, which was demonstrably of COVID. Most now, because there are so little dead, they now talk of cases. But the more people you analyze, the more you have cases. But people don't even know they have COVID. No. I, I probably had it was like a small flu. Normally, the flu takes two weeks. 10 to 10 days to two weeks. This was over in eight hours. I've never seen such a strange flu. I had about three in my life and, and this one was extraordinary. Exactly the same uh, phenomenon than extreme cold uh, and you know, trembling. I don't know how you call it in England, but, but um, and, and very aching everywhere. And it was over in eight hours. So and most people who have had it have this thing and then some people who are already very ill generally through bad faults bad treatment uh, getting too much uh, antibiotics or mixing the, the wrong uh, chemicals get really seriously ill but because they don't know what they are doing in Italy an absolute scandal there isn't a, a commission in Berlin who interrogated the doctors from Italy and they explained exactly what happened why there were suddenly these lines of coffins in front of Crematoria. You know why? These lines are there everywhere, all the time, because there are no crematoria, almost no crematoria in Italy, because people don't want to be burnt. So now the world press was there photographing coffins, which stand there for years, because it's very slow. <laughs> and it, it's a gigantic plot. And when you talk about the plot, they call you conspiration. Of course, it's conspiration. This conspiration of the thousand most important companies in the world, corporations, who meet regularly, not just in in, uh, in Geneva and in Davos, but, you know, they, they agree amongst each other. And they totally agree to install here what China has already, which is a complete uh, surveillance state. And the, the thousands of, of satellites which are being launched, they are not just there for make more stars in the in the sky, but just to to have total surveillance you know, and make money out of it. You know. So, you know, because we have the 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 great profession, we can do marvelous work. We have enormous satisfaction with our work, and but when you look at what most people do in their lives, they are, most people are terribly frustrated with their stupid work. You know, there's a book by David, I think Gray or something, who was a teacher. At, he died last year was a teacher at the London School of Economics called Bullshit Jobs. He analyzed what, what most people do during their day in administration, in fabrication, in, a, in teaching, in, in this and that. They are usually horrible jobs. We are one of the rare profession, us and the people who built airplanes and design motor cars, who are really happy with our, our work. But look at artists, the nonsense they produce. I mean, they are the most frustrated, always having to sell nonsense on the wall, well, you know the scene from inside. <laughs> I mean, those are not happy people. We are you know, the people who do our work. They are all fantastically happy people with their work. You know, maybe they have problems with uh, with the tax <laughs> or family, but their work is fantastic. I mean, designing towns or making beautiful buildings is unbelievable work. And when you have the right craftsman, it's incredible pleasure. But we are the exception. Even priests don't believe anymore in God. So even the priests are frustrated. <laughs> I think we are the last profession who still do something which is really pleasant. Yeah. I mean, Janusz even built his own house. I don't know whether you saw it, but it's absolutely incredible experience. I, yeah. I, I think that's right. And I think actually, I mean, I. Uh, the reason I'm a classical architect, apart from being sort of born into it, is um, such an entertaining form of architecture to do with the ornament and the decoration and the cross. And, you know, I really have no interest in detailing a shadow gap. That strikes me as a very boring thing to do. Um, and um, yeah, well, I just looked at the time and we've taken way too much of your time. Admittedly, some of it was me trying to get the technology sorted, but we got there in the end. Um, Leon, thank you so much for your time and sharing well, your, your scheme at the beginning. And um, 
telling us so much about architecture, town planning, and all the politics and everything that surrounds it. Um, and um, yeah, thank you very much. I, I hope one day soon we will not look back at today as a great time <laughs> <laughs> when we all live under surveillance. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's, it's all very difficult. I'll see you on Wednesday, Leo. Oh, yes. <laughs> Robert, yeah. see you soon. Huh? Okay. Safe travel. Great. Thank <laughs> you. Bye bye. Thank Goodbye you. to all. Bye bye. Bye, bye Leo. Bye. Thanks, all. Thank you very much. Excellent.